Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. We're so happy to have y'all. If you're visiting with us, welcome, welcome. You know, we want to make everyone feel, you know, loved and everything. So I hope you all are feeling blessed, feeling, you know, loved by the Lord today. Um, pretty interesting thing that happened today. I went in um, the ETSU Culp Center, and they were having like this... Um, it was kind of almost like a cultural fair almost. It was like they had a lot of many different people, many different like cultures represented. There was a lot. It was probably the most prominent, I believe, were Hispanic, Japanese, Korean, and I think there was there was Indian uh, culture in there as well. And I just saw some of the outfits and just the just some of the things that I thought were really beautiful and really just incredible artwork. And I said, and I just thought to myself, man, isn't God just great? You know, he, God created all people of this world. He created everybody to glorify him. The Bible says he created all nations, all people, all tongues. And, you know, it's just amazing to, to know the gospel is not just an exclusive thing for, on, for only certain people. It's for everyone. We should Sir, you know, God's love does not um, exclude um, culture. It doesn't exclude languages. It's God's love is for every person in all of the world, in every single corner of the world. And, you know, if God loves people like that, our love should look like Christ. So we should be willing to love all people with the same um mercy, compassion, and grace that God loves us with, and we should be willing to treat them that way, and it's just, you know, amazing to see how, you know, God, God made us, and, you know, he's just, God's so good, he's so, so good, so speaking of the Father's love, without further ado, we are going to be on page 431, and we are going to sing the first and the last verse of an oldie but a goodie, Jesus Loves Me. So if y'all would stand, and we will sing. on page 456. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear? Okay. We're going to be on page 456, and we are going to sing the first and the last verse of I'm Standing on the Solid Rock.
Good Wednesday evening. Wednesday night prayer meeting, Bible study time. I'm glad you're here to share it with us. Do you have your prayer list? Let's see who we're praying for. <clears throat> Robert and Teresa, Andra and Keith, Jake and Shay Holder, Dustin Lauren, Kathy Atkins, Betty Villier, Villier, Marie Lowe. Marie was in church Sunday, did you see? Doing better. Ed and Joanne, Viv and Mike. Last last word I had, Vivian was home, but Mike was still in the hospital. I haven't heard anything different. So you keep praying for them. They've, they've really been through some trials lately. Matthew Ledford, Pauline Clark, Stephen Lisa, Mindy Fagan, Tracy Fagan, Lindsay Flish, John and Sarah Fagan, Kayla West, Tanya Fugit, Tony Bennett, Clark Tesh, Chris Crumley, Matt Womack, Ethan Womack, Brian Pelagi. Reagan, Matthew, Madison, and Natalie White for the town of Jonesboro, Artie and Tammy White, Tim S., Nicole Widener, Grace Constable, Lisa Buckingham, Teresa McNeese, Patty Roberts, Colleen Buchanan, Kenneth and Peggy Bird, Michelle Simpson, David Rittenauer, Jonathan and Kelly Tipton, Avery, Ava, and Austin Ann, Taylor and Maddie Allman, Heather Hughes, Justin and Grayson Wilcox, Kelsey and Chesney Hughes, Dalton Byrne, Hannah, Everly and Ella, Beth French, Madison and Kennedy French, Jacob Lincoln and Cleo Schaefer, Olivia and Peyton Hulse, Jacob Murr, Keith and Reese Hulse, Kathy McCoy, Brenda Dickey, Judy Vivito, Peggy Bird, Children of Divorce, Parents of Divorce, Russell Roberts, Mr. Murr, Barbara, Dwight, Jr., and Jenny Briggs, church visitors, Ian, Debbie Harrell, Tammy Cloyd, Brenda Will and Chad, Tommy Moody, Bebe and Anna, Mary Jane, Jason and Jerry, our nation and troops. Well, I could almost stop there about praying for America and praying for our troops and uh, talk for a while. Our nation's in a bad spot, aren't we? When the, there's storm clouds on the horizon. Pray for Larry and Gail, Rosemary and Peggy, Alan and Jessica, Josh and Haley, Ricky and Amy, Alan and Cindy, Frank and Judy, Reed and family, Jerusalem and Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Bethel Ministries, Church Family, Patton Family, Violet and Tammy, Parker family, Trey Adams, Davis family, Geraldine Dye, Tyler Lord, Randy and Myra, Rick and Kathy, Rick and Angie, Anita, Josh and Megan, Anthony, Ezra and Sora, Tristan Bales, Andrew Bailey, Jolene Garst, Brenda McCurry, Danny Hicks, Dustin Woods, Chris Walters, Bobby Poss, Ernie Mosley, Marvin Roller, Mike Garst, Charmaine Mitchell, Jenny Fisher, Aileen Roller, Mark and Lisa, <coughs> Hunter E. Stepp, Taylor Tester, Kenny Garland, Shannon Tino, Elaine Hullman, Shannon Brooks, Cindy and Debbie E. Stepp, Josh and April Bowman, Caitlin and Joshy Bowman, Barbara Cooper. Barbara said she's doing some better. She was at our Bible study tonight. <coughs> Pat and Roger Miller, Lost Family, Carolyn Bowman, Bill and Jan Fitzgerald, the road of her family. Mike and Vivian, Brenda and Ricky, Shirley and Janice, uh, Marty, Philip and Ashley, Jade, Alex and Amara, Julie and Caleb, Davis family, all of our families, Ellis families, Alan and Becky Edwards, Michael Campbell family, Louise Dameron, Chelsea, Kylie and Grace, Sean, Lindsay and Aria, Beverly, Roger Duncan, Valerie and Jeff Dykes, Wayne and Carolyn. Sister Carolyn had, had a time with a, a tick bite and some sickness from that. 
and Brother Wayne's uh, been unable the last few days to take his treatments because of his blood platelets, but that, that's another family, another couple that's really being tested right now. Nancy McCarty, Carol Parker, Danny Francis, Jerry Breeden, Dana Rogers, Candy and Bob Roberts, Sammy Combs, Judy Fleming, Herb Smith, Jeff Toth, Peyton Toth, Vanessa Dykes, Mark and Susan Stidham, Anthony and Tricia Mills, Zach Mills, Stewart and Carson Stidham, Jacob and Maggie, and Pastor and Miss Debbie. I had the name of Linda Prater, having surgery tomorrow morning. And then Miss Tommy sent her list with Chad. I pray for Brenda and Chad and Will, Brian and Beverly, Mary Jane, Pat and Dawn, Sherry and Tom, Pastor, Debbie, Maggie, Jacob, Bobby and family, Mike, Dave, Liz, America, Israel, to witness more, and for Mr. Sal. And Miss Tommy's dealing with some issues and not feeling so good tonight, Brother Chad, right? So she said, be sure and pray for her. Those are the ones I have. I had the name of Harold Pruitt. Harold Pruitt, that's someone kin to Sister Linda Richards that she asked to put on the list. Chad? Chad's mom had a foul, sprained her ankle. I sprained my ankle when I was in high school on the football team. <coughs> and, uh, and the doctor said that my sprain was, was worse than if I'd broken it. So a sprain can be really bad, and you pray for Miss Brenda. She was here Sunday and was in good spirits and was feeling better than she has in a while and, and uh, might be a while now before she gets to come back. Let's lift her up. Right, they're going to have to do some more surgery, I think, right, for Miss Tommy. All we have is Marty. Pray for that family. Pray for Susan and Lori Bird. Pray for Miss Angie Booker, for Ann Booker, for Fraser family, and Mikey's friend Jeff. Some of y'all don't know Mikey, do you? Y'all know Mikey? Was Mikey here when you were here? No? Lynn and Kim, you don't know Mikey? I wish you could know Mikey. John, you and Lynn know Mikey? No? How long has he been gone? A long time? Several years? We need to get him back and introduce him, don't we? Mikey's a retired military fellow that has Lou Gehrig's disease. And he's, he's been dealing with that, goodness, uh, almost, I guess, as long as I've been here. And shouldn't even be alive. But man, he loves God. And loves people. Alan? She's your cousin, isn't she, Tim? Kathy McCoy. Going to Atlanta for major surgery. Of course, I, I mentioned the other day, the only, only minor surgery is that's done on somebody else. <laughs> it's always major if it's me. Angela? We 
especially for Amy. Miss Debbie had an endoscopy today. And anytime she has anesthesia, she sleeps for two days. So I, she got up and said, do you think I should try to go? <laughs> <laughs> Alan? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Amen. Our service is this Lord's Day. Prediction is 70 some degrees and sunny. That's not necessarily important to me, but it seems to be to a lot of people. <laughs> and so we'll have a good crowd Sunday, Lord willing. A question? I don't even know what blood type I am, Alan. But that's but that's a good theory. I like it. His his blood applies to everybody, doesn't it? That's all right. Amen. Steve got back from Vanderbilt, and they say he's healing. It's slow, but he's healing. He's still not able to put any weight on that foot. If he gets to come to church, he'll still be in a wheelchair for a while. But he's. Amen. Tim got rid of his boot. He did. Wonderful. I, I got the. There's some things I can't. I can never explain. Miss Debbie and I got a, a bill in the mail today from the University of Buffalo Neurology Center. Because we went up there a month or two ago, you know, for her angiogram, and and the procedure cost twenty one thousand and some dollars, and it showed what her insurance paid, and it was something like five hundred that her insurance paid, and then it said balance due twenty one dollars and eleven cents. I'm not good at math, but <laughs> God is. And he's, he can turn $21,000 into $21. There was a line on the bill that said adjustment made $20,000 and some dollars. I, I don't know who adjusted it except the Lord. And I'm good with that. I, there's some things, there's no other explanation. And I think sometimes God likes it to be that way. 
and, and we ought to automatically give him glory the first thing, but sometimes we have to look around and say, is there any other reason that could have happened? And, and there's none. There's none. She, her, her endoscopy was good, no problems at all in her throat or stomach, except there's a mobility issue with her muscles in her throat. And so it, it may be fixable and it may not be, but it, she said she thinks it's stemming from the brain issue. And you know, your, your throat's, your esophagus is muscles, right? And it, I, was, I was asking the folks over at Bethel tonight, said, you ever tried to swallow standing on your head? And they said, well, no, I never tried that. And I said, well, you ought to try it because you can. Because those muscles actually push it down. And if you're upside down, they'll push it up. And her muscles don't work right. So that's why food gets stuck. <laughs> that might make it worse. Pick her up and shake her and shake it on down maybe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for being in the Lord's house. We're among friends and family and brothers and sisters. And we've got one thing in common. The blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to us all. And it's a good fit. And it's a cleansing blood and a washing blood and a forgiving blood. And we're so thankful that he humbled himself to become a man and shed his own blood for my sins. We'll thank you for that throughout the eternity while the ages roll. We'll worship you and glorify you and the Son, the Lord Jesus, that gave himself for us. So many on our list tonight don't have that. They are separated from the promises of God, strangers to the covenants of hope, and we pray for them. Oh, that their eyes might be opened that they might look around and, and see the shape that our world's in, that the storm clouds coming up on the horizon, the dangers that are ahead, and might realize that, that things are not going to go on forever as they are now. And we better know what the end is, and we need to know the, the last chapter of the book, that the Lord Jesus comes and brings judgment on the unbelievers and gathers his children home to be with him forever. And I pray that every name mentioned tonight might come to know Jesus as their Savior. I pray for those we mentioned that were sick and hurting and recovering. And pray, Father, for those that are going through struggles and trials and testings of, of great hardship and pain and suffering. I pray for them. I pray that they might know you and might trust you and depend on you that they might be lifted up and encouraged in their spirits, and Heavenly Father, that their faith doesn't waver. That we can just go on believing you, no matter what comes, no matter what the circumstances, the situation, that we might believe you, trust you. For every need that was mentioned tonight, we're glad you know, and you can meet them right there at that place of need. Bless our church and our church family, all those that have a part, those that play the instruments, those that sing, those that teach, for those that give to support this work of ministry. I pray you return unto them a double portion for their giving and generosity and their faith in you, that you're a God that blesses us so we can be a blessing to others. Bless our service this Lord's Day and, and bring in folks that need to hear a gospel message. And Heavenly Father, this Sunday, we know that already you've laid the plans and prepared the hearts for a message on the great white throne judgment of God. And I pray that you bring someone that needs to hear about what's ahead, to how they might stand at that awful place unless they come to know Jesus. Prepare our hearts and minds. Begin even on Saturday to, to prepare us that we might prepare our own hearts to be ready for worship and to come into this house on Sunday morning rested and, and Lord prayed up and prepared and ready to worship and rejoice and be a ministry to other people. We'll thank you and praise you for it. May the Holy Spirit of God come be our teacher tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> What's next after the millennial kingdom and the rebellion of Satan.
and the fire from God comes down and devours the rebels. In the very next passage, John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. So what's next is that great white throne. Sunday, Sunday morning, Lord willing, that'll be what our message is. Tonight, let's start in the book of Genesis chapter 12. We're going to start something new tonight. We're going to start doing some studies on Bible characters. We may even study some people you've never heard of, but they're right there on the pages of Scripture. The one we begin with tonight you have heard of. And we're going to see if we can learn something tonight about Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's Abraham, and that portion of Scripture is what is known as the Abrahamic covenant. God made a covenant with one man made him some promises. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And I'll make you a blessing. To every nation, every family on earth, Abram, I'm going to make you a blessing. And I'm going to protect you. Those that bless you, I'll bless them. And those that curse you, I'll curse them. In chapter 18... The Lord repeats, confirms that promise to Abraham. Chapter 18 and verse 19. The Lord says, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after them, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. That's the covenant. The Lord said to Abraham, I know you. I chose you. I selected you. And I'm going to bring upon you everything that I have promised. But you know, Abraham, when we first meet him here, his name is Abram. And the name Abram means exalted father. I believe Abraham, or Abram to begin with, was an exalted man. I don't believe he got rich when he got to Canaan. He may have been rich when the Lord came and first spoke to him. Exalted father. God changed his name to Abraham. What does that mean? It means the father of a great number, a great many. Isn't that strange? How old was Abraham, you suppose, when God changed his name? He was, he was in his 80s or 90s. And God said, you're no longer Abram, you're Abraham. You're the father of many. <laughs> Next day, Abraham goes to the barber shop. Well, hey, Abram, good to see you. Oh, I'm not Abram anymore, I'm Abraham. Why are you Abraham? Well, that's what God called me. Well, don't that mean the father of many? Yep. Well, Abraham, how many kids you got? Well, don't have any yet. And how old are you? Well, I'm, I'm pushing 100. And God called you the father of many? Abraham, you might have had a... Not, you ate... <laughs> You ate Papa John's pizza with too many of them peppers on it last night. 
It would have been strange, wouldn't it? Because if, if I remember right from the time that God made him the promise, you and Sarah will have a son, wasn't it, like 25 years? I think he was 75 years old when God first made him the promise and was 100 when that son was finally born. Abraham was the 10th generation from Noah. That means, and I calculated it up, you know, so-and-so was such and such age when he had so-and-so, was such and such age when he had so-and-so. It means it was that Abraham lived about 400 years after Noah. Of course, even after 400 years, I suppose the story of the flood was still fresh in their minds because some of the people, you know, that had descended from Noah and his sons were still alive and lived a long, long time. Abraham was a descendant of Shem, one of the three sons of Noah, and his father's name was Terah. Somebody asked me once, was Abraham a Jew? And I said, well, well it could have been. There wasn't any Jews. You know, Abraham didn't go to Canaan because that's where the Jews lived. There were no Jews. There might have been people who were descendants of Shem that were called Shemites. And that sounds an awful lot like what they're called today, the Semites, doesn't it? You know, anti-Semitism is a hatred of the Jews. But there weren't any Jews when Abraham was called by God. Abraham had two brothers, and he married his half-sister. It means his daddy had more than one wife. And his daddy and another woman had a child, and his daddy and his mama had a child, and he married his half-sister. Her name was Sarah I. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but it's not Sarah yet. S-A-R-A-I. So to distinguish them, I'm going to call her Sarah or Sari I. Interesting, the name Sarah I means dominating controlling. Well, Abraham had him a dominating, controlling wife, Sarai. When Sarah was 90 years old, the Lord changed her name. And he changed it from Sarai to Sarah. Genesis chapter 17, God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, I thy wife, thou shalt not call her name controlling, dominating, but Sarah shall be her name. The name Sarah means princess. It means a noble woman. So years into their marriage, God gave him a new wife. He said she's not a controlling, dominating woman anymore. She's a noble woman. She's a princess among women. Abraham's family were idol worshipers, including his own father. In Joshua chapter 24, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So the home that Abraham grew up in was a home that worshipped idols, worshipped other gods. Little things like that just fascinate me. So here's Abraham <coughs> growing up in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. You've heard of Iraq and you've heard of Babylon in Iraq. Ur of the Chaldees was an area about 200 miles southeast of Iraq. It was in a place called Mesopotamia in old times the land of the Chaldees. That's why it's called Ur of the Chaldees. It was actually, at that time, Mesopotamia was in its golden age. I mean, they were prosperous. So Abraham, uh, he must have been a businessman or something because he, he, he was good at keeping cattle and sheep and making money. Matter of fact, the Lord blessed him so much he turned his money into a lot more money. In Ur of the Chaldees, there's something there that was there when Abraham was there that no doubt he saw. You've seen the pictures on TV of the pyramids. 
in the, in the Great Pyramid of Giza, and there's two other little ones there, and there's the Sphinx there. But have you ever seen a picture of a ziggurat? It's a man-made structure that's kind of like a pyramid, except it goes up on four sides, and it has steps all the way up with little terraces built on the side of the steps, and they would plant gardens and trees on the terraces, and it would go way up high, so far away you could see it, and on top it'd have a flat platform, and that's where they'd worship idols. The ziggurat was built there. It's a beautiful thing. It was dedicated to the Sumerian moon god named Nana. And Abraham would have probably seen that. He may have even used it, or his family used it for worship. Ur of the Chaldees. In Acts chapter 7, verse 23, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into a land which I shall show thee. So Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees when he was called. How do you suppose God called Abram? Do you suppose he had a dream or had a vision? Or do you suppose that God spoke in an audible voice, Abram, leave, follow me. And, and the question I had is, when God spoke to Abram, how did he know which God it was? How did he know that it wasn't one of his idols speaking to him? And, and that's why I suspect that God spoke to him like he did Moses with an audible voice. And that's how Abram could distinguish this God from all the others. A voice came from a burning bush or came from a cloud or came from heaven. Abram, come, follow me. You know why I believe that? <laughs> because what had Abram's and his daddy's idols ever said? Nothing. They don't speak. So if a voice speaks to him and says, I am God, you will follow me. Abraham, which God? The God that created the heavens and the earth. The God that speaks and expects man to obey. Maybe that's why Abraham followed this God and said, all the other gods I'm leaving. Here's, here's all the other gods, Psalm 135. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. So when Abraham had a God that spoke to him, he said, this must be the one true, real God. And he followed him. That's about the best explanation I can come up with. So Abraham is going to leave the land of the Chaldees and go he doesn't know where. We know where he will end up. He will end up in the land of Canaan, which also is a land of idolatry. But if you look on a Bible map from Ur of the Chaldees, it's a straight shot across to Canaan. Only thing is, what's between them is, is what is now Saudi Arabia, which is desert, right? And so it couldn't possibly go from Ur of the Chaldees straight across the desert and get to Canaan. There wasn't water. It, well, you'd perish on the way. So they had in that day what was known as the Fertile Crescent. It was shaped like a crescent, a crescent moon. You would leave Ur of the Chaldees and you would go north and you would go across. And up there at the top was Haran where they stopped, where Abraham's father died. And then from Haran you would turn south and you would come back down through Syria and through Lebanon and come into northern Canaan and you'd enter into Canaan land. Matter of fact, the journey was about 1,500 miles. It wasn't just a little short walk. It was a long journey. 
and he didn't even know where he was going. God just told him to go. Some people believe that Abraham was a merchant. Genesis 13 says Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Well, he must have been a pro prosperous man when God called him. We know he was familiar with keeping sheep because he had lots of flocks and herds. From what you read about him in the Bible, it seems that Abram was well educated, was a wise man, a smart man. Abraham occupies an extremely important place in history because a lot of the people groups that are in the world today are descended from Abraham. And probably more important to us in a very real sense is people of faith are said to be children of our spiritual father Abraham. He's the spiritual father of the believers. He's the father of the faith. In Romans chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So all of us, in part, owe our salvation, our spiritual experience, to this man. It's a part of that original covenant where God said, I'm going to bless them that bless you, and I am going to make you a blessing to all the nations of the world. Does it say nations or families? Let me look at that again in Genesis chapter 12. Families, and in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. How in the world is it possible that this one man who's involved in idol worship, that God calls and says, come and go and I'll tell you, you're there when you get there. How in the world can God take this one man and choose him and use him to be a blessing to your family and to my family? Is he? Was he a blessing to us? Well, I can think of two ways right off. Matter of fact, Paul said in Romans 10 or 11, he said, one thing we can be thankful to the Jews for is that God used them to give us the scriptures. Well, was Abraham a Jew? Don't see how he could be. There weren't any Jews yet. Then how, how does that involve us? Well, Abraham had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had a son, too, actually, but the one that was important to us was Jacob. Jacob's Abraham's grandson, right? Jacob's name was later changed, and he had 12 sons. And those 12 sons, the sons of Jacob, became the 12 sons of Israel because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So Israel, the Israelites are descendants of Abraham. They are part of the deal in the Abrahamic covenant. I'll use you, Abraham, to bless all the nations of the world. And it was through the Jewish people that we have this. Now, can you think of one family in the whole wide world the Bible hasn't been a blessing to? Whether they receive it as a blessing or not, it sure is a blessing because it has revealed to them the true and living God and His plan of salvation, whether they received it or not. So through Abraham, the Bible is a blessing to every nation of the world. I can think of another thing that came through Abraham that was a blessing to every nation. Can you? When you study in Matthew, and I think Luke's gospel in the New Testament, you have the genealogy of Jesus. He's from the tribe of Judah, right? Judah, the son of Jacob. Jacob, the son of Isaac. Isaac, the son of Abraham. Our Savior, our Messiah, is a descendant of Abraham. And when you look at those New Testament genealogies, they go right back to Abraham. 
is a descendant of Abraham. Our Savior was given to us by the Jewish people. Of course, God chose them and God made that to happen. But all of that began when God chose this one man and said, come follow me, I'm going to make you a blessing. Isn't that something that, that, that somehow that we have to dig to understand your and my salvation is related to the covenant God made with Abraham? I think that's a wonderful thing. So he's the spiritual father of all believers. He said, Paul said, he is the father of us all. God chose one man and one family and one nation and from that point, dealt with the sins of the whole world. What a blessing that is. So God made the covenant with Abraham and God confirmed and established the covenant. And by the way, Abraham's not just an Old Testament figure. He's mentioned 67 times in the New Testament. And what does the Bible say about Abraham? He believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. Because he believed God. Abraham's a model of faith for all believers. It's just why I suppose he's called the father of faith. Can you imagine God comes to you and says, where you are right now and what you're doing right now, cease and desist and come follow me. Well, where are we going, God? I'll tell you when you get there. Come follow me. And for a man that's just been brought out of idolatry, it's going to take a lot of faith to say, well, I've recognized you as the one true God. And if you're the creator of heaven and earth, you own everything anyway, and you own me, and you own where I am, and you own where I'm going, so if you say go, I'll go. That'd be a pretty big step of faith, wouldn't it? But if you do, I'll bless you. Can I, can I get into a personal antidote here? I don't have to ask your permission, do I? <laughs> I just have to warn you ahead of time. <laughs> Miss Debbie and I got married in 1973. She was 16 and I was 17. We rented a little trailer in the Thomas edition of Bloomingdale, $50 a month. On our wedding night, we went to the grocery store bought groceries. We lived there three or four months and then her daddy helped us to buy our own trailer. And he had a lot we could set it up on. And we lived in that trailer for maybe a year or two. Had our two children, or at least one of them there in that trailer. Lived there for a while. Then we bought a house in Colonial Heights. Two bedroom, one bathroom house. It cost us $18,500 for that house. A fortune in those days. We lived there for a few years. I was in masonry work. I'd finished an apprenticeship. In, in those days, I could easily make $10,000 a year. That's pretty good money back in the mid-70s. So we build a house. We build us a brand spanking new house. <laughs> we picked out the house we wanted. It had to fit the lot, of course. We built us a house and we made it the way we wanted it. And I can remember, we, I bought a, because we were trying to save money, I bought a used garage door off trading post, put it in the basement. And we were painting it. And the two kids, Matthew and Susan, they wanted to help paint it. So I took a paintbrush and on the door I wrote five and I wrote a three because that was their ages. 
and I had them stand in front of that garage door with those numbers, and I took their picture just as a memory. They were three and five years old. I think the garage door. And we lived in our brand new house, and we were so proud. Man, we'd invite people home from church on Sunday night and say, you need to come and let's have some snacks and stuff. Just wanted them to see our new house. We were so proud. And we were serving God, and I was singing in the choir and teaching Sunday school and going on visitation and driving a church bus, and, and we was just saved. We finally, we'd gotten saved during that time, and we was happy and serving God and loving God, and things were good. I'd taken over the whole masonry business and had my truck and mixer and scaffold and everything you needed to go out and make your way in the world. And I began to feel like God was saying to me, I'm calling you, come, follow me. Well, Lord, where are we going? <laughs> I'm calling you into the gospel ministry. Whoa, Lord. My daddy ain't a preacher. My grandpa ain't a preacher. My great-grandpa ain't a preacher. My uncles ain't preachers. My brothers ain't preachers. My cousins ain't preachers. And they ain't no way I'm the first preacher out of this family. Because I ain't special. I ain't no different than any of the rest of them. And I couldn't get that out of my mind. We had a little Volkswagen bug. Y'all remember them things. You actually had to take the gear shift and push it down and then go over to get in reverse. You remember that? Well, I had one parked in the yard, and our son, Jacob, just three or four years old, was playing there in the front yard. And I put that thing in reverse to back out, and I didn't have it in reverse, and it took off forward. And I barely missed him and just nudged the edge of the porch, just didn't do any damage, just nudged the edge of the porch. And sitting in that car, it, it was almost as if God said, see how easy I could take something from you because you won't follow me. Scared the life out of me. And, and it's true. He could. If, if God chooses to do so, he can convince us. He can prod us in the right direction, can't he? And I'm still dealing with that. When I tell people God wants me to be a preacher, they're going to say, <laughs> who do you think you are? Scared me to death. Our choir went to sing at a revival. Mm, I forgot, New Hope Baptist Church over on Boone Lake. We went every year for a revival. It's the same evangelist every year. And we loved him to death. And after the service, I went up to this evangelist and I said, I, I need to ask you something. I feel like God's called me to preach, but how can you know for sure? He said Proverbs 16, 3. What? <laughs> Proverbs 16, 3. And I went and read Proverbs 16, 3. And it says this, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Commit your way to the Lord. Say, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do, but whatever it is, I'm willing to do it. And then God will establish your thoughts. I think the commitment needs to come first. Commit your works unto the Lord, and he will establish your thoughts. So I committed my works to the Lord, and he established my thoughts. And I went and told my pastor, God's called me to preach. And I thought he was going to say, great, I'll line you up some places to go preach. He didn't say that at all. He said, oh, that's great. You need to go to school. <laughs> go to school? I've already been to school. I graduated 280-some out of 300. And that was without trying. I never tried. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to go in the masonry work in the construction work and I was going to make a good living and I was going to build me a house and Miss Debbie and I were going to eventually get us a little place with a creek and a picket fence and little barns stretched up the hill behind it and all of them going to be white with red roofs. Need to go to school. <laughs> Q 
Keep in mind, this is getting up towards the late 70s. There's no internet. There's not even cell phones. Go to school? What kind of school? Where do I go to school? And so I started talking to other preachers and other ministers and asking them, where's the school? Where does a preacher go to school? And you know, in those days, in northeast Tennessee, the prevailing thought was preachers don't go to school. You just open up your mouth and God fills it. Some people still believe that today, right? You just get up there and open up your mouth and God tells you what to say. And the, the Bible say that preacher? Yes, it does. But it's not talking about preaching. It says when you get arrested and taken before the magistrate, don't worry about your defense. God will give you the words to say. It has nothing to do with standing in a pulpit and proclaiming the word of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And deep in my heart, I knew I needed to go to school. I didn't know anything. Didn't know anything about the Bible or anything about Christianity or Christian history. So I started sending out inquiries, and, and I got literature from a school in California and one in Oklahoma and uh, you know, Moody in Chicago, and Pensacola in Florida, and Bob Jones in South Carolina. And man, I, how, how it was so overwhelming. I had no idea what I was going to do. But I committed my works to the Lord. And he said, if you'll do that, I'll establish your thoughts. It was a rainy day, and Brother Lynn, on rainy days, you get a day off, whether you want to or not. In, in construction work, if you're working outside, you get a day off. So I had a day off. And one of my friends called me. Matter of fact, he's Reggie Weems, pastor over at Heritage Baptist. He, he had just surrendered to preach just a short time before that. And that's one thing that bothered me. Lord, I'm not just following him, am I? I'm not just doing it because he did. But he called and said, there's a speaker over at such and such church over in uh, Bluff City, and I'm going to go hear him, and I want you to go. I said, well, I'm not, not doing anything else. I believe I'll just go with you, and we went. And he told me who it was, and I'd never heard of him. He said, he's the head of a school, and I'd never heard of a school. So we went, and I listened to him, and, and I, I can't remember a single thing he said. I mean, he was a, he was a elderly man then, and wasn't that memorable what he said. But, but after the service, one of the preachers that was there, Cecil Sturgill. Y'all remember Cecil Sturgill? Always ended his radio broadcast. Look up, friend! Jesus may come today. Tabernacle Baptist Church over in Kingsport. He said, I want to take you up and introduce you to Dr. Lee Robertson. I said, okay. And he took me over to introduce him. said, Dr. Robertson, this is Terry Cleek, and he's been called to preach, and he wants to go to school. And Dr. Lee Robertson looked at me and said, how old are you? I think I was 25 or 26 by then. Are you married? Yes, sir. You got any kids? Yes, sir, I got two. You can do it. We've got 1,400 married students, and if they can do it, you can do it. From that moment, my thoughts were established. That's where I'm going to school. If 1,400 other people can do it, I can do it. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So I went. And we shopped around everywhere for a house to rent and couldn't find anything. And it was getting close to time to enroll in school. And so we bought a 12 by 60 mobile home here and moved all of our furniture out of our brand new house and put it in that mobile home and pulled it to Chattanooga. And I enrolled in school. My thoughts were established. I didn't have any regrets. But <laughs> I didn't burn all my bridges. I rented the house out in case I ever got to come back, I'd still have my house. And, and the last year that I'd worked masonry work, I made too much money and I owed in taxes because I, 
I didn't, I mean, if you're a, almost a high school dropout, you don't, you don't pay quarterly. <laughs> you don't keep up with what, and, and, and it comes time to file taxes, and I, I didn't have it. And so I sold the house to my dad for just a little bit of equity because we hadn't been there hardly any time. And uh, I took the money and paid off my taxes and paid off my first year's tuition. And we lived there four years. And <laughs> A hillbilly went to Chattanooga and a hill William came back. And I'm still just a hill William because I got a degree. Somebody said a degree is like an extra curl in a pigtail. It's pretty, but it ain't no more pork. <laughs> so I got a degree on the wall, but it ain't no more pork. I have some sense of what it's like when God says go and I'll guide you. And, and I also have some sense about 84, 94, 2004, four, about, <laughs> I also have some sense of about 40 years later of how God blesses you when you follow him. And, and maybe I've been a blessing to you through that. And I know there's some folks up in Blumville I've been a blessing to. There's folks up there still that every time they see me, they call me pastor, hi pastor. I miss you so much. I've been, because, just because God directed my thoughts and I committed my works to him, he's made me a blessing to a lot of people and he's used so many people to be a blessing to me. That's Abram. Abraham. He just followed God. And boy, when you follow God, when you hear his voice and when you call you and you know you're in his will, you can't be any more blessed. Uh, those four years weren't necessarily a blessing. I didn't know what a semester hour was. I went to register and, and I said, what do I need to take? And they made fun of me. They said, well, we got an opening in Chaldean basket weaving. And I thought, okay, sign me up. I had no clue that you, 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 you declared a major and you followed the course and you took the classes that were required for that. I had no idea. But they helped me eventually and they signed me up. And I took 12 hours my first semester. 12 semester hours. This story could go on all night, you know. And, and I have never in my whole life tried my best at anything. I can say that honestly. Never had I tried my best. I played on the high school football team. I could have been a star. <laughs> I could have got a scholarship to maybe Emory and Henry or Milligan or somewhere. But I never took it serious. I'm out in the summer laying brick and block and working, and they're calling me and saying, you need to come and lift weights. And I'm saying, are you crazy? I'm lifting weights all day long and making money and buying me a car. And then when school started, I went and said, I want to play. <laughs> Never tried my best to anything. But when I knew what God wanted me to do, and he sent me there, I said, this is one thing I'm going to give my everything to. And I had no idea what that meant, but, but, but after my first semester, I had classes on the first Corinthians, Bible classes. I had classes in doctrines, and I had classes in premillennialism and Bible history and English and algebra. <laughs> because of my SAT scores, I had to take freshman algebra. And after that first semester, I went to get my grades slipped. And my grades said A, 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 B. I was on the dean's list. I had honors because for the first time in my life, I determined I was going to give my best to everything. I went to my first Corinthians teacher and I said, I didn't make an A because I knew I hadn't. He opened the book and said, well, 
you didn't take your coats, so I nudged it on up there for you. This story could go on all night, but there's a point somewhere in there. Sometimes God calls you to come and follow me. So God, where are we going? I'll show you. God doesn't always direct you ten steps ahead. Sometimes it's just one step. You take this step. Then I'll tell you the next step, then the next step. When God told Abraham the first step, leave your family and leave your father's house and go, Abraham packed up and went. And as a re result of that, this is what we have today. We have God's plan and God's program carried out through those Jewish people. Good place to stop. We're, we're not through yet. Abraham had some weaknesses. Do you know that? Matter of fact, the truth about Abraham was he was a sinner. And the truth about that is God takes old sinners and uses them. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for our time together just to look some into your word and study about this man that you called. And through him brought blessings to all the families of the world. Again tonight, every name mentioned on our prayer list, would you meet that need according to your perfect will? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.